Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, my name is Derek Dosenbrock. I'm with the Federal Highway Administration in the Resource Center, uh, working with Ben Rivers on the A-Game, Advanced Geotechnical Methods of Exploration. Uh, this webinar is part of our winter webinar series. It's webinar seven. Uh, today is December 29th, 2020. And today's topic is measurement while drilling, the digital drill rig. Uh, we're going to be discussing today what measurement while drilling is, a history of the MWD technology, some discussion of fundamental concepts and its uses as applied in particular to geotechnical site characterization. We're also going to be talking about some guidelines on MWD for site investigation and uh, case studies from Montana's MWD implementation, as well as discussing their interest in expanding MWD uh, using hollow stem augers. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of speakers today. Uh, Anahita, uh, let's see, Madiria Sari, um, uh, John Benoit, uh, Paul Hilschen, and Nick Janes uh, from WSP, the University of New Hampshire, and the Montana Department of Transportation, respectively. Uh, with those introductions, uh, we're going to dive in, and I'm going to ask uh, Anahita to uh, start us out today uh, with her presentation. Thank you, Derek. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can. We're good. OK. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining the presentation. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about an introduction to guidelines on MWD for geotechnical site investigation. The outline of the presentation is going to be an introduction to MWD and its background, the equipment requirements, the MWD recommendation for geotechnical site investigation, including the test procedure and reporting requirements, interpretation of the MWD results. And at the end, I'm going to finish it with some of the examples of MWD investigation in geotechnical engineering. Now let us start first with what is measurement while drilling or MWD. MWD is the application of continuous and real-time monitoring and recording of drilling data during the drilling process which can be done manually or automatically with some of the sensors that are installed on the drill rig. Each of these sensors, they can monitor and record each of the drilling parameters and they record them, display them in real time without any interference with the drilling process. MWD is synonymous with some other terms like monitoring while drilling, which is also abbreviated as MWD, drilling parameter recording or DPR, automated monitoring equipment or AME, which is mostly used for construction quality control purposes in drilling and grouting operations, or logging while drilling or LWD, which is mostly used for geophysical measurements in oil and gas industry. MWD was initially used in energy resources exploration for the precise and real-time directional drilling. And concurrently, we can also use this system to record and monitor each of these drilling parameters. But in energy resources, because the drilling depth can be several kilometers, so each of the sensors need to be near the drill bit at the bottom hole assembly, and then we need the transmission system to be to transfer the data to the ground. So the system used in energy resources is very complicated and expensive, and we cannot use it for the simple drill rig that we use in geotechnical engineering. And the good news is that we don't need any of these complexities for geotechnical site investigation. MWD is a newer concept in geotechnical site characterization, which is used for measuring the mechanical response of a rig's drilling system during the advance of a borehole through soils or rocks. And it was initially used with installing a device called NPASOL on a non-coring rotary rig or also coring rig. The benefits of using the MWD in geotechnical site characterization is to provide continuous information about the subsurface. We can evaluate geological structures of a strata. These continuous surfaces 
like crack, boundary, joint, and void, and get some information about the properties of soil and rocks. It's very cost effective because it's actually recording and utilizing the, by the byproducts of the current normal drilling practice with minimal additional costs or effort associated with core sampling, geological mapping, geophysical logging, and laboratory tests. So it doesn't have any of the problems with sample deterioration when it's exposed to fresh air that for the samples that we need for laboratory tests. It's technically feasible to install it on a drill rig and it's not disruptive to operators. It also provides some feedback for drillers to optimize the drilling process. We can actually control the drilling process by adjusting the mechanical parameters to their optimal values to have a balance between the penetration velocity, data and sampling quality and cost. So far, MWD has been mostly used in European countries to support the testing in boreholes for mining and grouting to have an estimate of the depth of the rock surface to uh, determine the depth of the cavities or to get an estimate of the bearing capacity. However, rock assessment using MWD or the material assessment is a newer concept with limited work completed. ISO is an international standard which is specifically for the use of MWD in geotechnical investigation and field testing. And it also includes some specification regarding the testing procedure, the requirement of the, uh, the equipment, and also the data logging. In US, MWD has been mostly used for drill and blast and grouting projects. And it's not yet an standardized method which is used for civil and transportation projects. So FHWA has asked WSB to put together a guideline on the use of MWD for geotechnical site investigations for US practice. And the final purpose of this guideline is to behaviorally distinguish between soil and rocks and find the effect of drilling equipment, drilling tool, and also soil and rock layers on the drilling parameters in both quantitative and qualitative methods. So in this presentation, I'm going to have an overview of this guideline. Now first, talk, let's talk about the equipment requirement for MWD. Regarding the drilling equipment, essentially any drill rig which is successfully used for sampling and testing in geotechnical site investigation, uh, either it's a rotary or rotor percussive drilling, it can be instrumented with MWD. It can be either hydraulic or mechanical driven drill rig. But the point to keep in mind is that, for example, if you use a rotary drilling, it helps to complete the core description in case of poor recovery. Uh, but the cost of rotor percussive drilling is one third of the rotary drilling. The measuring system can be either manual or automatic in this presentation and in the guideline, we will only focus on the automatic measuring system. We need some sensors and transducers to be installed on the drill rig to, like for example, the displacement sensor, depth sensor, inclinometer, vibration sensor, and some sensors and transducer to measure different drilling parameters like the rotation speed, the fluid injection pressure, the flow rate, and if it's like this figure, if we have like a hydraulic driven rig, we can use some pressure transducer to measure torque and thrust. And if it's a mechanical driven rig, then we can use the torque rosettes and the strain gauges to measure these two parameters. In addition to these sensors and transducer, we need a data recorder and displays and the data acquisition system in the measurement system. The MWD recommendation for geotechnical site characterization has been explained in detail in the guideline. But now I want to have some of the, uh, to highlight some of the key points regarding the test procedure. For example, regarding the test location, even in the planning phase, we need to consider the interaction uh, effect between the MWD test locations. And we need to know that some of the drilling methods can cause disturbance to the ground. Uh, based on the recommendation by some researchers in Florida Department of Transportation and University of Florida, the distance between the MWD test location can be three to five times the borehole diameter. 
but this number needs to be larger when we are using a specific drilling method like the air flush drilling. The orientation the, of the boring can be different. Uh, actually, the boring can be at any orientation. We just need to have the drill mass and the applied rod in that direction and per ISO, the deviation from the applied load and the intended axis should be less than two degrees. When penetration occurs, the movement of drilling machine needs to be minimized by applying some load, but the rotary table, it shouldn't be fixed to prevent the deform of the drill rod. All the equipments need to be calibrated before we start the, the MWD procedure the initial condition of the drill bit needs to be inspected, and we can also quantify that based on this figure that is shown in ISO. We need to do a calibration test before we do any actual MWD measurements, which is basically having a locked bore, destructive borehole next to a sample and cord mount, so we can correlate the MWD results with some of the geological and geotechnical information that is obtained by SPT uh, or some other tests like pressure meter or so by some core description when we are drilling in rock. The other uh, purpose of doing the calibration test is to set the drilling parameter so we can have the, the maximum mechanical efficiency of drilling with the minimum energy. And in case of coring, we can also get the maximum core quality and recovery. We, as much as we can, we need to keep these drilling equipment and tool during the drilling process constant. But in case we change them, then we need to do a new set of calibration to find the new correlation between the drilling parameters and the soil and rock uh, subsurface properties. Each of these drilling parameters need, or it's recommended to be measured at depth interval per ISO. In case some of the sensors are measuring these parameters in time interval, we can also take the average of them and record them in depth interval, which is usually in the order of like five millimeter. The, measure, the MWD measurement can be done in different quality classes, like quality class one, which is with six or more number of parameters. And for example, quality class three, we only need at least like two drilling parameters. And in the last column, you can see the allowable minimum accuracy of measured values for each of these quality classes. At the end of drilling, we can verify and record total boring depth with a depth sensor. We also need to report any equipment change or replacement, check the final bit where, as I mentioned before, uh, with reference to this figure and compare it with the initial condition because it can significantly affect the results, uh, which I'm going to talk about it later. We also need to check the accuracy of the measured parameters and if it's larger than the allowable minimum accuracy of measured values, then we need to discount the MWD results or put them in a lower quality class. The MWD report consists of two field and test report. In this figure, you can see an example of field report, which includes the summary log, record of measured values and test results, preliminary description of soil and rock, and some information regarding the test location, equipment, procedure, and measured parameters. The test report includes the field report and also a graphical presentation of test results and MWG log. Now let's talk about some the interpretation of MWD results. After we finish the drilling, we get two different categories of data. The first of them is the drilling parameters. Some of the examples of these drilling parameters are listed here. These parameters are directly measured, are directly measured and recorded during the drilling process with some of the sensors. For example, we can use the proximity sensor to measure the rotation speed or rotary encoder to measure the vertical movement of the drill rod and penetration length, which can also be verified by using the depth sensors. In the hydraulic driven rig, we can use the pressure transducer to measure torque and thrust. And for a mechanical driven rig, uh, we can use the torque rosette and the strain gauges to measure these two parameters. These parameters are either uh, 
imposed by a drilling method or are, are set by the operator or are the results of the response of the ground. Usually during drilling, we, we try to keep some of them constant and then measure the other parameters to have, to have consistent data. For example, we try to keep the thrust, flow rate, and rotation speed constant, and we measure usually the penetration rate and uh, torque. After we get these drilling parameters, we need to process and filter them uh, to remove any signal noise or noise because of the drill rod addition, and also to convert all the units to engineering units. The interesting point is that even looking at the noise in the data, it's sometimes informative for us because it shows the interaction between the drill bit and the soil or rock layers. And each of these soil or rock type, they can create noise in a specific drilling parameter. The second category of data is a compound parameters, which is a combination of the drilling parameters and it's calculated based on these drilling parameters. Because we normalize these drilling parameters, so the compound parameters are not, uh, are lim they actually limit the influence of different drilling equipment and tools. And so they provide more information purely regarding the geological structures in the subsurface. In this table, you can see some of the examples of the compound parameters, but I'm going to talk about some of the very most uh, widely used drilling uh, compound parameters like the drillability strength and Summerton index, which is the rock resistant to drilling or the specific energy, which is the energy per volume required during drilling. And it has two components, which is the thrust component, the ratio between thrust and the cross-sectional area. And the other one is the rotation component, which is the ratio between the rotation speed and the penetration rate. Research has shown that this rotation component is 10 to 200 times greater than the thrust component. And also the rotation components is larger in rocks compared to soil, so they, it can provide some information regarding the depth of the rock surface. So in general, the use of a specific energy is very helpful because usually during drilling, we also try to keep the thrust constant to, in, to prevent the stall of the beat. And the thrust doesn't usually provide that much information regarding the material strength. But after we get these results from MWD, we need to know that there are some factors that influence the results and they should not be interpreted as the changes in subsurface. One of them is the drilling method. For example, in this plot, you can see the changes in different compound parameters versus the depth for two different drilling methods of rotary and rotopercussive. The results show that the results from rotopercussive drilling are smoother, smoother than rotary drilling, and they are not that sensitive to the slight variations in subsurface. This can be because the energy required with rotopercussive drilling is because of the energy with the hammer, which is imposed by the hammer, is less than the energy required in rotary drilling. So the rotary drilling can provide more information and detail regarding the subsurface stratigraphy. The other factor is the drilling tool. In the top figure, you can see some of the examples of the drill bit for the rotopercussive drilling. And in the bottom four figures, you can see some examples of the drill bit for the rotary drilling. Based on the geometry and properties of these drilling bits, each of them, they have a different fragmentation mode for the soil and rock. And so they affect the drilling parameters in a different way. For example, if you look at this plot, which shows different compound parameters versus depth for different drilling bits for a rotopercussive drilling, you can see that the energy from a cross bit is less than the energy required with a drag bit. So when we are advancing a borehole in the sandy material, the cross bit is the drill bit that we can use to have a fast advancement of the boring and drilling. The abrupt changes in the summer tone index and normalized energy 
they can be because of the addition of the drill rod and they should not be interpreted as the existence of, for example, some voids in the substructure. Also, we can see that the changes that we see in the sonority index is big, it might be because it's significantly influenced by the change in injection pressure after we do the drill rod addition. So like mentioned before, we need to try to keep this drilling equipment and tool constant during the drilling when we are doing the MWD measurements. And in case we change them, we need to do a new set of calibration to find the correlation between the drilling parameters and the solo rock properties. The other factor is the bit burn. For example, in this figure, you can see that we have the missing cutting teeth after the drilling. Any significant changes in the penetration rate and the specific energy, they can be an influence of this bit wear. For example, if we have like 90% bit wear, it can cause up to 30% reduction in the penetration rate and we need up to three times more energy than the initial condition when we have the beach burst. So again, this shouldn't be interpreted as changes in the subsurface properties. Fluorite also affects the friction between the uh, soil and rock particles and the drill bit and flushing and cooling of the system. And in general, when we have higher flow rate, then this friction decreases, we can get maximum mechanical efficiency and we, we can get minimum energy required for drilling. Also, the research has shown that when we use higher constant flow rates during the drilling, we can get a better correlation between the UCS of rock and the specific energy. The other factor is the overcrowding of the drill bit, which can cause some fragmentation and damage to the uh, rock core. And so this influences the penetration rate, it decreases the penetration rate and it increases the specific energy of drilling. And all this energy is wasted to damage the rock and it's, it shouldn't be interpreted as some of the natural fractures that exist in the rock core. And the last factor is the operator. The operator needs to be familiarized with the MWD procedure and uh, should be constant during the drilling uh, to get the consistent data. And if the operator changes during the drilling, then it needs to be noted in the MWD report. Now let's talk about some of the examples of the use of MWD in geotechnical engineering. Uh, GUI et al. in 2002, they used MWD for the detection of ground strata for grouting project in tunnel construction in Kennington Park in London. When they were doing the drilling, uh, like a rotary drilling uh, in a hydraulic driven drill rig. They measured the drilling parameters every five millimeter using an impassable device. The interesting finding of this project is that they, when they only look at the raw data with all the noise, they found that, for example, if you look at the mud pressure, the noise and the average value in the gravel layer is less than the clay layer, which can show that the bit was clogged in the clay layer. Or for torque, the average value and noise in the gravel layer was higher than the clay, clay layer, which can show that the particles jam the drill bit, so we need more torque to advance the drilling. So in general, even by looking at the noise in the data, they were able to differentiate between the soil uh, layers in the subsurface. So at Coxkey et al. in 2010, they characterize the subsurface condition using drilling parameters for a deep foundation project in Boston. The purpose of this project was to estimate the depth of the reinforced concrete diaphragm for the support of excavation of a nine story commercial use building. They did the drilling in both soil and rocks and they correlated the drilling parameters with the stratigraphic changes that they obtained with the two inch split a spoon test. They found a good correlation between the ratio of water pressure to truss and the stratigraphic changes. And in this way, they could 
decrease the number of split spoon tests. They also correlated the drilling parameters with the estimated RQD when they were drilling in rock, and they used MWG to find the changes in the geology of the rock and also estimate the depth of fractures to know where to perform the Packer test for hydraulic conductivity testing. So in this way, they could also decrease the number of Packer tests when they were doing the drilling in rock. So in general, they were able to save 40 to $50,000 and 12 to 16 days uh, of drilling by using the MWD in this project. U et al. in 2004, they identified the subsurface volcanic weathered zones in Hong Kong when they were doing a rotopercussive drilling using a DPM device. And by looking at the changes in the penetration rate, they could identify all these different volcanic weather, weathered zones in subsurface. Lundstein et al. in 2015, they estimated the strength of Cambridge argil argillite for design and construction of G Foundation in Boston. After they measured the drilling parameters, and because they also had the testing from the UCS and some of the Brazilian, the results from Brazilian test and the point load test, they correlated the results. And uh, they actually first calculated some of the compound parameters like the summertime index and the drilling energy. And they found that there is a good correlation between the drilling energy and the UCS of the rock, which is better than the correlation between summertime index and the UCS of rock. Rogers et al. in 2018, they measured the rock strength while drilling shafts socketed into Florida limestone, which helped them to minimize, to reduce the uncertainty in shafts capacity and also to provide quality control for foundation engineer and drilling contractor. In this project, they also found a very good correlation between the specific energy and the UCS of rock. And they also found that the thrust component in a specific energy is only 0.13% of that specific energy. And at last, Lodo et al. in 2009, they characterized rock mass during the construction of two railway tunnels with TBM in Spain. They did the drilling in different rock materials like sandstone and shale, and they found a very good correlation between the specific energy and the number of joints, rock mass rating, the uniaxial compressive strengths of rock mass, and the dynamics Young's modulus. So these were just a few successful examples of the use of MWG for geotechnical site characterization and civil and transportation projects. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, Anahita, great. Thanks for that uh, presentation. We have actually quite a few uh, questions in both the chat and the Q&A. Um, so let's start off uh, with just one of them and we'll try and handle uh, most of the rest in the discussion area. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, how often does the bit wear need to be estimated? So like I explained on what I read in the literature, we need to first inspect the condition of the bit before we start the MWD and the drilling. And then after the testing is done, if after the drilling is completed, we need to also check the condition of the drill bit and compare it with the initial condition. But we need to keep in mind, in case we need any significant changes in some of the parameters like the penetration rate or the specific energy, which is like the byproduct or the calculation based on that, that significant change can be an indicator of the bit wear. So at that point, we can go and see, check the bit wear and see if there is any significant uh, wear in the bit. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're gonna ask uh, Anahita to uh, try and answer some of the questions in the chat uh, as we proceed to our next speaker, uh, John Benoit from the University of New Hampshire. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to be uh, to attend this uh, webinar between Christmas and uh, New Year. And I'm sure you know that we want to get rid of this year very soon. 
Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, let's go back here. Sorry about that. Let's do a new share. And um, I'm going to do this. There we go. Move that in here. Um, for some reason, I'm trying to get the, the right screen here. Yeah, um, I think you need to exit the share and then reshare. So if you hit the red. Stop the uh, share. Okay. Yep. And now reshare the other screen. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'm glad somebody knows what they're doing. Um, can you see this point now? Oh, we can. Looks good. OK, great. All right, so um, again, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jean Benoit. I'm, a, um, I'm Canadian. I'm not French. I'm French Canadian, uh, just in case you're wondering. Um, I've been, I'll be talking about MWD. I've, I've was first introduced to MWD um, in 1992. I was uh, on sabbatical in Italy and they were developing a, a piece of equipment that was doing uh, uh, measurements while drilling. So I was very interested in that. And eventually we got a project in New Hampshire and, and bought the equipment uh, in, in 2000. So we've been playing with this for a while on and off. Uh, it's very interesting and you'll see uh, there's a lot of things you can do with MWD. Um, this is the, the outline. I'll, I'll go a little bit over what uh, Anahita did before and then go through the analysis of the uh, recorded drilling parameters. We'll look at some applications and look at future work and then I'll have some summary and conclusions. Okay. We, there's a lot of, of uh, in-situ test methods out there uh, as uh, shown here from Maine uh, 2012. There's, there's so many, it's kind of hard to keep track of them. Uh, but frankly, um, drilling of boreholes must be a considered an in-situ test method and it's not listed in there. This is probably the only test method uh, or one of the only test method that can that doesn't have any limit in applicability. You can use it in all types of soils, all type of rocks. You can use it at any depth you want, uh, vertical, link line, you name it. It's really universal. And so, and there's hundreds of thousands of, of boreholes drilled every year in this country. And we waste all that information that could really go in the database and, and help everybody really. Um, major uses of geotechnical boring. So if you're a geotechnical engineer, this is probably boring. Okay, it's, it's hard to do these webinars. You, you can't get a feel for the audience laughing or just turning their eyes. Um, but anyway, you can define the geologic stratigraphy in the structure. So you have a little uh, schematic in here. So you can see the structure of the subsurface. You can obtain samples. For instance, you can do uh, the SPT here, so perform in situ tests, get some samples, install instrumentation, uh, monitoring well. So you see here a case where you have some monitoring well. So that can be uh, used for environmental assessment and remediation, uh, evaluate existing structures such as dams, uh, foundation installation, installing tiebacks and so forth. So there's a lot of application of geotechnical borings. Uh, so what are, uh, what is measurements while drilling? Um, until recently, um, we, at least I used to call it DPR. Uh, MWD was really for the oil industry and then they started calling it DPR and we went with that. But more recently, everybody has turned to MWD. So it's a computerized uh, drilling monitoring system. Um, I look at, at some of the uh, questions from uh, the audience uh, and uh, cost-wise, uh, if you buy just about everything, uh, you're probably looking at about $25,000. Um, it records everything uh, continuously and automatically uh, as, as a short distance, as little as five millimeter and you could go higher so five to 20 millimeter, 
it's real time display. So you have a computer screen in there that you can look at uh, for these new system, even systems that were uh, that are 20 years old, still uh, you get a real time display. It wasn't as fancy as this. Um, and then the data is all stored uh, electronically. So you can download that data uh, directly on your, your PC um, fairly, very easily. It was first introduced in the oil industry and then it's been used uh, in Europe quite a bit uh, since the 60s for various str studies, stratigraphic uh, studies, detection of cavities. So for instance, in France, they have a lot of limestone, a lot of cavities. So they've been using these systems extensively. You can see a little, little diagram in here of, of uh, some uh, MWD parameters in here, how they respond based on what you have here, the total void or half of uh, an area that's got rubble at the bottom and void at the top or, or loose material. So you can see the different uh, response in these systems. Uh, you've seen this uh, before. Um, this is a good slide if you want to practice your practice your French, so you have the French translation in there. Uh, but these are all the the sensors that can be installed on a typical uh, drill rig. Um, you can install all of these. Uh, it it uh, the only one that's a little bit more difficult is is torque. Uh, if it's not a hydraulic rig, uh, then the torque is more difficult to measure. But otherwise, you can you can measure all the other parameters. This is a list of the parameters. Uh, so these are, they can be installed. You don't have to install all of those, but those are all available. So the advance rate, the down thrust, uh, the whole back pressure, the whole back pressure is essentially, um, you look at the pressure cylinder, you got pressure on both sides. So it's the back side of that uh, cylinder. So that can be uh, useful when you start getting a little bit deep, you might have to hold back some of that pressure. That's what that is. Uh, I know that was one of the question. Uh, the torque, the rotation rate, the percussion energy, if you use a, a percussion uh, rig, the drilling fluid injection, so the mud pressure, and as well as the mud flow uh, in. And uh, we've done uh, some project where we also look at what comes out. With this system, uh, you have a junction box uh, where all these things get connected. And then you have the drilling parameter recorder, the little computer uh, where all the info information is uh, uh, displayed and stored. So th these are, this is some view of some of the equipment. This is our, our recorder. Um, we, uh, we are very happy to know that we were gonna, we're gonna get a new system very soon. This is 20 years old. It's a little bit bulky and they had a, a, a printout in here and a digital display. So all the, the sensor connected to the rig and they go to this junction box and from the junction box, it goes to this recorder. The sensors essentially, when you look at the measuring hydraulic pressure, uh, so if you're measuring the, the down thrust, um, you're measuring the hydraulic pressure. And so what all we do in here is you put a T connection on the hydraulic line and, uh, and then you put your sensor in there and they have quick connect so you can remove them if you don't wanna move them to a, a different rig or you need to repair, uh, you don't have to make a mess every time you do that. So you have different, different ones for different applications in here. There's also something called a driller's button and it's, it's pretty big button, it's about this big and drillers have big hands and they wear gloves, so you can't give them just a little tiny button. So that's what that is. You can see a picture close up in here. It's got a, uh, uh, it's magnetized, so you can just stick it on the rig anywhere you want. And so the driller will use that to start the recording and also to indicate when there's a change of, uh, uh, there's a, a, a rod being added. Uh, this is the depth sensor. It's essentially um, a wheel, okay, where you have a, a cable, uh, some sort of cable in here. Um, and uh, so as you, you attach um, the system here and on the table, and as this moves up and down, it changes. It's a potentiometer, essentially. It changes the, the electrical current in there, and then you can calibrate that to depth. 
So you have to install that on your uh, drill mass. So there's two different rigs in here. Um, these are flow meters. Uh, typically, if you use a flow meter, you would use one to look at the flow going in. And here we have the pressure sensor, the, the, the mud flow. And uh, in this case in here, we did this project that Anahita was talking about in Boston. And we measured the inflow, so the flow going in. And we put a T connection on the return in here so we could measure the outflow as well. So that could be very helpful if you want to know if you're losing uh, fluid in your formation, that means you, you do have some serious fractures in there. Um, this is the rotation uh, sensor, it's an electrostatic um, sensor, so electromagnetic, sorry, sensor. And so on a, on a drill rig, you can see here where the table is, you usually have a, a bolt pattern and the bolt pattern is usually 10 or 12 bolts. And so you put the sensor maybe a quarter inch or so away from the bolts. And every time the sensor sees a bolt, it records it. And then you enter in the computer that say 12 volt is one rotation. So that's how you, keep, you uh, keep track of the rotation per minute. Um, these are <clears throat> action photos, I guess you could say of uh, this is in Boston, this is in Boston also, and this is out west in Colorado. And, and one thing that you notice is the driller is really focusing on that unit. And here's the driller button in there. They really love using the system. And it's, it's just, uh, they learn really, they have a number to what they've been doing for years. You know, you ask them how fast you're rotating most of them don't really know. They'll give you a number, but it's not even close. They go by feel. Um, so now they got a number so they can play with that. They can see when things are, are, are changing uh, very quickly. Um, there's different drilling parameters uh, categories. You have those that are imposed by the drilling method, but they're not recorded digitally. Uh, the tool type and the diameter, the performance limits of the machine, the injection system and the fluid type. There's, then you have the machine, machine parameters that are controlled by the operator. So the thrust on the drilling tool, the rotation rate and the fluid flow rate. So that's what the driller controls. Then you have the response from the ground. Okay, so the advance rate is the, the ground response, the torque, the fluid injection pressure, the return rate and the whole back pressure. And then you have all the other non-control parameters such as the tool wear and, and the changes in the drilling fluid composition. Um, so these are typical application, uh, as you saw in the previous uh, presentation. It will certainly improve the drilling efficiency. You get a much better geologic profile uh, you can detect voids, fissures, and other an anomalies that you have in there. Uh, again, it's used in any material. And uh, you can manage a drilling operation. Uh, and maybe some of the drillers might not love that, but you know exactly when they're working. Um, so there's no four-hour lunch anymore. Uh, and, but it does not interfere with the drilling operation. So it, it doesn't take any extra time uh, for the driller to use this system. So that's great. Easily installed on any rig, and it really leads to a much better understanding of the drilling process. So let's look at some uh, analysis of these systems. Um, so this is your typical recording in here, say from 20 to 30 meters. Um, so you got some fluctuation in there. Um, you got the penetration rate, the thrust, the torque, the water pressure, the inflow, uh, and the rotation, okay? So the first thing we need to do is to process and filter the data. You're recording an enormous amount of data. Um, so you have first to concat concatenate, so that means you're putting every section that you record every five feet, say, you put them together to put, to uh, make a, a, a full profile. And then you're gonna remove all the drilling artifacts. So whenever you change a rod, you're gonna have 
changes in these parameters, but they're really not, they, they don't represent anything but the change in the parameter. So you can remove this and the software allows you to do that. Then you can, can uh, you convert to engineering units and then you filter the signal noise. And that's because there's a lot of data. There's different ways of, of doing this. Um, one way that we found that, that works pretty good is, is doing a sliding uh, moving average. So for 20 centimeters. So we take the values 10 centimeter above the, that depth and 10 centimeter below, and we do an average and we keep sliding that down. And that gives you enough information but not too much that so that you you know if you have too much information then you really you really can't tell what's going on um because drillers will do different things uh they, they'll have different ways of drilling okay maybe more pressure more rotation um these uh, these you have to look at these values and and then combine them to normalize the information. So those are compound parameters. And Anahita talked about that some. Uh, so they combine all these drill, drilling parameters to into expression of energy or empirical indices, okay? And it will reflect the resistance of that geologic uh, medium to the drilling. And then you can develop site-specific. If you work in a certain area, you can really develop something for that particular area. So it's less dependent on what the driller does and the drill rig and the drilling tool. Okay, so these are the various equations in there. Um, they, they look daunting, but they're really not very complicated. Um, so let's take a look at some application. The first one that we did was uh, at Pease International Trade Port, which used to be an Air Force. and uh, we're doing bedrock bioremediation. So they had TC in there. Um, you know, the Air Force had a tank for uh, uh, putting all the, 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 the cleaning agent uh, back in that tank that they were using to uh, clean air, airplane parts, but the uh, tank had an overflow. So the tank was really never full because it had an overflow and just go right in the bedrock. Um, so we really wanted to see um, where the fractures were so that we could do some uh, bioremediation in there. And we look at the effect of the drilling tool. So we looked at coring versus a destructive borehole. So this is an example here of a cord borehole. Uh, it's a six inch uh, triple core barrel. Um, and this is the core, the core is four inch. So did some geophysical testing as well, acoustic televiewer, optical televiewer, which is just a camera in the hole, a caliper log, and then we compare all of this. And we were able to tell where these various fractures were, okay? And that was confirmed by these geophysical uh, methods. So we saw that these three fractures, the penetration rate increased up to 50%. The water pressure decreased, which you would expect, right? And some of these parameters also decreased in there. Um, I really wanted to see what a destructive borehole would do in that project. So we had a six inch trichome bit. That's a very big bit. And uh, it really reflected similarly, uh, but the water pressure response was more constant than the, for the coring, because you have freer flow. When, you, when you're coring a rock and you have a core barrel, the flow gets restricted in there, it gets plugged up at times, and especially with a triple core barrel. And, and uh, I'll, I'll show a list of references at the end in there. So if you're interested in reading about these projects, uh, we did a project in Brookline also. And the idea in there was to reduce the number of SPT boreholes. So this was the master student that worked at Pease on the bedrock bioremediation went on to work for Sandborn Head and Associate. So we worked together on, on uh, this project in here. So we continue that work with him. Uh, so Anahita showed that. Uh, so you have the penetration rate in there, the thrust, torque, water pressure, inflow. And then we found that if we take the water pressure and divide it by the thrust, we can come up with some values in there that are indicative of their various types of soil. So you can create your own um, 
compound parameter if you want to. It's not always the one that are in existence that will help you uh, the most. And this is, it takes a little bit of uh, experience. You know, you, you have to work with the data and, and eventually you start really getting a feel for what's important, what's an indication of what. Okay. Uh, we did another project uh, on the, in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I was very interested in trying to correlate that with the SBT. So what we did, we did a number of boreholes in there where they would do SPT and then we would drill between uh, the, 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 the next SPT and then we'd do an SPT, drill, SPT, drill. And so this is what we did. So the SPT here, um, the black circles, and then we looked at the, um, the, the, the energy, the specific drilling energy, and we plotted that, that's on a different scale, but you can see the trend is very, very similar. And that's very, uh, this is in a glacial fluvial deposit, very common in the Northeast, a lot of bony kind of material that's difficult to sample using the SPT. But in here, you get the information in between. You get a lot more confidence in here uh, in your data. You fill in the gaps in the, the, the details. This is two holes that are closely uh, located and you can see it was fairly consistent, even though that material was really um, like I said, very bony, very variable. Uh, this is a 21 story building in Boston. And uh, they, they were um, really concerned about the quality of, uh, of the rock, what was coming out of the core barrel. Uh, what was core coming out of the core barrel was this, but they didn't really believe it. They thought the rock was much better than that. And um, so the RQD was low. This is the driller. This is the driller's favorite tool. Okay, so you get, you can imagine you get the core barrel up and he's banging on this and this is uh, Cambridge Argillite, very easy to fracture. So we use the um, drilling parameters to determine, okay, when we have 100% or 90% RQD, what do we get in terms of parameter? What do we get in terms of penetration rate, okay? Uh, when we have a change in, in uh, lithology, what do we get when we go from basalt to argillite? What do we get when we have a fracture zone? So we put all that together and we were able to determine that the actual rock in place was much better than was, what was coming out to the surface. So because of that, uh, they were able to save back in 2007, 50% uh, reduction in caisson length, which added uh, came out to be about half a million dollars. And this is the site in here. Um, on that same project, I had another student that, that wanted to do a little uh, uh, master's project in this case. So we took all the cores from that project and we ran 152 lab strength tests. So we did unconfined uh, Brazilian test, the splitting tensile strength and, and the point load test. And, uh, and the tensile test is a more fundamental test, not so influenced by the, the test method. And we compare that to what we measured in the field uh, with the uh, uh, MWD in terms of Summerton index and drilling energy. And so we looked in here at the unconfined compression test, uh, Summerton versus the unconfined strength and drilling energy versus the unconfined strength. And we did the same thing for the tensile strength. So the argillite is known for its extreme ver variability. So a lot of uh, bedding planes is very anisotropic. Uh, the drilling energy seemed to be a better indicator of strength, uh, probably because it includes the torque in there. Uh, less scatter again in the tension than in compression because it's a more fundamental property. Um, here we looked at point load test and the point load test in the literature gives you these correlation here. The QU is equal to 24 time this point load strength index. Um, and we found from our testing, really looking at this in here, the corrected point load versus these indices that it was really more like 13 and not 24. And the same thing with the tensile strength. 
So it's got a lot of value in there. So you can get the strength of, of your material. Future work, uh, we're looking at the uh, possibly developing classification charts. So we're looking at histograms and cumulative distribution curves so we can see uh, if it's following a normal law, if we have looking at our data here, say frequency versus the Summerton index for different type of material. We're also looking, this is from, um, we did a paper on this. This is using a, uh, a very large database uh, from a uh, consultant in, in France and just trying to see if we can do something similar to what Robertson has done, um, Robertson and, and Campanella have done in terms of classification charts using the, the CPT. So this is, you can't get too, too excited yet. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Not quite that simple, but you can see possibly we can get some sort of chart like that. That would be really, really cool. Um, future work, we need to work on the design of a torque sensor and you'll hear Montana talking about that. They're really ahead of the game on that. The influence of, of tool wear, the influence of drilling fluid properties, other sensors that we can install, vibration sensors, accelerometers, and really making these systems more automatic. And that's becoming more and more prevalent uh, in, in Europe. Um, MWD can easily detect all kinds of changes, thin layers, fractures, degree of weathering, rock quality. It, for best comparison, it's, it's, it's best to keep drilling parameter constant from hole to hole. You gotta do the same thing so you can see the changes. Uh, effective tool type is significant, whatever you decide to use. And uh, again, we can use in situ, we can determine rock strength using MWD. Cost uh, leads to cost savings in drilling time compared to doing SPT, which are very uh, time consuming. And in design, less surprises. You know what's down there. You're not missing. When you do SPT every five feet or 10 feet, you're missing portions. With this, you don't miss anything. Uh, we need to uh, standardize the system just like Eurocode is doing. And then I just talked about classification. And uh, MWD can assist in all geotechnical work in soils and in rock, and drillers love it. Um, so thank you. This is uh, putting this as evolution in here. This is your typical driller. Uh, if you've been uh, drilled with probably drillers from seven, at least seven or eight countries, they're all the same. Uh, not all the same, I shouldn't generalize, but a lot of them are pretty rough sometimes and uh, things can fly. And Evolution, this is a, a lady uh, doing drilling in Sweden. So their systems are more uh, uh, automatic and uh, she doesn't have to lift too many things. And you can see she's using the DPR in there, the MWD and recording the information. These are students that work uh, with and my colleague Reifstech, you've seen some of the references earlier. And these are some of the publication um, that we've done on, on the topic. So hopefully I did not go over time too much. Um, nope, you're right on time. So greatly appreciate your presentation and contribution today to today's webinar, uh, John. So appreciate having you here. Thank you. All right, we're gonna jump directly to our next two speakers. We've got a tag team uh, from the Montana DOT to present uh, their experiences with uh, measurement while drilling. It's always a pleasure to uh, share with our attendees uh, what's going on at our, our state DOTs. Uh, so with that, uh, Paul and Nick, uh, we're ready to see what Montana's up to. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm, uh, my name is Nick Jaynes. I'm a geotech engineer with Montana Department of Transportation. And that's where I'm, in, I'm now in our uh, geotech conference room that's pretty empty. It's been empty for a few months now. But it was nice to be back today for this. Um, this is a better place to do a presentation than in my basement. So Paul's, Paul Hilchin, he's also a professional geotechnical engineer. He's, he's at home. Uh, <clears throat> he's available here for questions and as to assist me as, as I need. 
So I'll start the presentation um, and share my screen with y'all. I don't know if I'm sharing it or not, but I should be. Okay, so you should be, you should see it now. Hopefully. Yep, we've got We're it. We're Okay. Now I'm going to turn off my video. My video is off, I'm, I'm hoping. And I can focus on the presentation. So again, uh, well, actually, I, I'll state my first first state that I appreciate the Federal Highway Administration and um, Ben Rivers and Derek Dassenbrock for helping us up with getting this up and running. We met with them last year in uh, Minnesota and talked about doing this, and um, we just decided to come back and start start getting the materials we needed for it, and that's how we we uh, got into this. And so we're um, probably we've been in this, I think first part of the year, Ju June, we, we started collecting data on uh, projects in June. We uh, have about six projects that are completed now that we, that we, where we use the NWD, uh, for drilling. And this presentation will provide the benefits of the limitations, challenges, and our future plan evaluation of this technology. This is the system. This is what it looks like when you get it. This is what it looks like when you, uh, when you you get it in, uh, when you when you get a, a, a delivered to your site. This is our CME 1050 ATV drill rig. It's relatively, it's it's fairly new. It's six six years old. It's a hollow stem auger rig, but it has the capability to do casing and vancing and also coring. And uh, with 25,000 foot pounds of torque and low ground pressure tires. In Montana, the CME 1050 is our go-to rig. It's a it's a powerful and versatile option for us uh, in a lot of our off uh, off-road locations. The photo on the right is our drill, um, our drill drillers, a couple of our drillers, and they they are installing. It looks like they're installing the installing the flow flow meter and uh, an injection pressure setup there. So these are the sensors that we put on our rig. These came from John Lutz. The first sensor. We we'll talk about is Dialog MX. You have to have this in order to see what's going on on, on your screen and to get the real-time parameter measurements. Next one is the the depth uh, belt-driven depth sensor that we installed at this location on the mast. Then there's the RPM sensor that's in, that we decided to install on the 90-degree um, gearbox. And the, the the reason we did this is to keep the cables to keep the cables um, short as short as possible and to also protect it from the rain. And so that seemed to be a pretty good place for it. Then you got the hydraulic um, connections that, that Dr. Benoit was talking about uh, that are tapped in here underneath the controls. And that would be for the hydraulic clamp so that you can stop uh, measurements of, down, of, of depth as when you, when you put on a new set of casing and you can move up and down the Kelly without, any, um, adjust, without, without the depth being adjusted. Uh, currently, there's not anything available for the hollow stem auger. Um, there, I think there's a there's a foot clamp sensor we're looking at that we're looking at. I think we actually got it, but we didn't put it. We didn't install it, but that's uh, would be nice to have something like that so we can stop uh, recording of depth when we put the new set of new augers on, new auger um, flights on. Then you got the vibration sensor that we put there on the mast up high, and then you had the flow flow and injection sensors. This this uh, setup was was placed here on a bypass so we could take take it offline if we need to. Um, as you can see, there's no torque measurements on the system yet. So this is a picture on the left of what you what you get when you get the system. And this is the this is the dialogger or as uh, Dr. Benoit called it, the junction box. Um, but this is what it looks like when it comes in. You got your schematic here. And then uh, on the right is what, you, what it looks like when we in, when we had it installed. The John, uh, um, John Lutz, they, they weren't able to give us a technician in, in the time frame we needed it back in March, uh, February, March, April, and because of um, because of the, the crisis and everything, so we we ended up uh, asking our our crews if we could, if there was some people that couple uh, guys that would be willing to install the system, and we had some interest, and guys thought it'd be kind of cool to to set up some instruments on their drill rigs. So these guys jumped up and decided that they'd do it. They stepped up and. Uh, it took about a week for them to install it, but during that week, they were able to troubleshoot uh, issues that came up. They were able to personalize the sensors in the locations they wanted them to be, um, gain, gain intimate 
experience and understanding of how the system works and how it may not work if it's having problems. They were also able to take pride in the system, which is a big important thing. And then, um, and, and, and then through great support from John Lutz, uh, their technical support was great. Uh, we had some problems on the way, but along the way, but they were able to help us out with that. So the first place we decided we wanted to put a torque sensor because this does not come with a torque, the John Lutz system does not come with a torque sensor. First place was on the drive shaft. We were looking at instrumenting the drive shaft. The reason for doing that would would be was so that we could we could maintain um, our, our drilling, continue drilling, and not have to uh, not have to take sensors on off and on. We have it measuring the torque at all times, regardless of whatever whatever drilling method we're using. So this is a picture, a schematic of the CME 1050 drive uh, drive line, and at first. We, we we were considering putting it on on one uh, putting the sensor on one of the uh, dry shafts here. Uh, however, these are about five thousand dollars a piece, and they're they're so they're difficult and, and they're 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 kind of tucked away and difficult to access. So we didn't want to have we wanted something that we could remove and and replace with a uh, or swap in and out and replace um, and and then have it inst have the piece instrumented. Uh, while we continue to drill, so we looked at this spot here. This is this is called this is between the uh, this is between the drive shaft and the transmission. It's called the companion flange. It's about seven inches in length, about one inch wall thickness. Uh, this was so what we did we had CME build us one of these, a separate one, and we had it sent to uh, to high tech sensors. They just they they put a torque bridge on it. as you can see here. There's the one one side of it. Instrumented it for us. We had a uh, this is a, a Lord sensor um, OEM board that we hooked up to the drive shaft, and we were able to measure torque. But there are some positive, uh, easily accessible. That's one one good thing. Relatively cheap part. The torque can be measured with any drilling me drilling method used. Uh, however, and however, the problem with that the, this location is the gear the gear ratio, the gear loss across the rig is not account has to be accounted for when you have the sensor back there. The uh, flange has been proven to be likely too a little too stiff to pick up small torque, and so there's some issues there with the with the companion flange uh, being a little stiff. Uh, um, and, and there's also some signal loss, possibly some signal loss across the rig, which we can uh, adjust that as needed when we um, by moving around the moving the um, the base station around. So then the second location we looked at was this the drill rod, API rod at the front of the rig. So we put a thousand foot, a pound foot, foot pound torque sensor there. And this uh, purpose was to measure measure torque on the front end of the rig so we could compare it to the torque uh, that we're measuring on the back end of the rig. This was manufactured by CMEs. We had a, a, a separate drill rod manufactured with a little bit more length so we could have a place to grip here and play, take it on and off. And uh, so we had that, that uh, installed for our second torque sensor. Here's a, here's a picture of, a, of a, the, the laptop when we had both sensors online. The one on the left is the API drill rod torque and the one on the right is the drive shaft torque. So they're both measuring a similar uh, tr trend, but, but you can see the, the API drill rod is giving us a much better, uh, res much better resolution and a little bit less no noise. So then, there's a there's a picture of the uh, of the setup, the, the communication setup. We stole uh, an idea from the Florida DOT on on how to on how to communicate with our sensor. We used went with Lord sensors, and we we purchased one of these base stations and had it installed. It's called the TorqueLink 200 base uh, TorqueLink 200 um, system, and this is this is the this is the base station um, for, for it. And there, this is placed in an electrical bo uh, electrical box here, out of the rain and, and wind and, and everything else. And uh, this thing communicates with that, communicates with the sensor, and then and then the uh, base station communicates with the data logger for the John Luke system, and also with the laptop sensor connect software that that Lord provides you. So uh, the this um, set the sensor the the Torquay 200 sensors. For, they they go they, they will go about 100 hours before they need before they need to be replaced. The batteries need to be replaced, and um, this data logger we found out that the da the uh, the data logger can power this base station, so we don't it doesn't have to be powered uh, separately. So that works out pretty well. 
So a little bit of, of, of uh, field testing results to show you. So the first place we went was right behind our drill shop. We have a place where we test uh, CPT rig and we do our SPT calibrations and that kind of stuff. So we went out there. This is a site that has uh, about 10 feet of 10 or 15 feet of, um, of uh, overbird material, silt sand, and then you have go right into a, a volcanic ash material. And so we've done some CT, CPT pushes out there, but we ha haven't been able to go any deeper than 10 feet. There was a question about that on the Q&A. Um, this, this is one of the benefits of NWD is we were able to go quite a bit deep, well, as deep as we wanted to, but uh, CPT was only able to push 10 feet out here. So we barely getting barely getting into any of the ash material. So we asked the driller to normalize down pressure at 500 PSI. And uh, when we when we drilled, you'll notice we had some a little bit of vibration up here in the upper le levels, and a little bit more vibration down here in the ash material. And so, but what you can see there's just not a lot. It's just not there's not a lot of movement there. It's pretty subtle. So what we ended up doing is moving that that vibration sensor up on the mast a little higher where I showed you. Originally it was down lower, so we moved it up higher, and it seems to have taken care of, of that problem. So then you see a torque measurements start, they start going up once you get into the ash layer, so that gave us some hope. And the uh, drilling speed dropped as you got into that ash layer. And so that made sense too. So we were pretty happy about that. Thought, well, great, this is a, they're ready to go for deployment in the field. So uh, in the future, we'd like to go back to this site and we do some coring and, and get some, some rock core and compare that to some of the parameters that uh, Dr. Benoit was talking, and uh, Anahita was talking about. So then we have Haskell Cooley is a project that's out um, eastern Montana where they wanted to build a bridge or a culvert and weren't sure what. So we went out and drilled and we, we drilled to about 26 feet in a very, very loose uh, silts and sands. You can see way to hammer, a lot of way to hammer out there. We uh, unfortunately we didn't didn't communicate to the drillers and the and the guy that's the, the newer guy that was out there about the system. So he, the, the torque sensor was not installed properly or not uh, set up properly. So we didn't have torque on this one. But we'll look at the data anyways without torque. Um, and so you, if you notice one thing, you notice there's a lot of, uh, there's some gaps in the data here, particularly in uh, moving the drilling speed down pressure and, and rotation. And this is this is due to the driller stopping every time, every five feet um, and putting on new augers. And so what we did was we asked the driller to start the drilling, uh, when you put put the auger on, start the drilling and then and then press start on the, on the system, and that seems to have cleaned up the data quite a bit. So then we we did some CPT out there, and you can see um, the correlation there that the, with the CPT, we, the tip resistance increases at 17, which correlates very well with the vibration pickup there uh, at that depth. CPT or inclination and trajectory changes in the CPT correlate very well with the gravels that we were picking up down here in the in this sand, and so we felt like that was a pretty good correlation. Vibrations jumped up quite a bit. Then we went, took it to another site out in Eastern Montana and uh, back in October, we augered through some silt and clay. And uh, during the augering, augering we, we, we uh, noticed that the, the torque was measuring about the same, same um, torque that was, was picking up on the sensor connect. So we were pretty happy with that, but then it, it kept coming in and out. We weren't sure why. So we had to reset everything at 20 feet and we put uh, we took the hull stem augers off and put the casing advancer on at that point, and uh, and it, you know realized there were some communication issues there. But then we when we started up again, we had both sensors on, and the system uh, is it, you know recording the drive shaft and the API rod together. You can see the drive shaft torque is dropping as you get further into this IGM um, intermediate uh, geomaterial. Uh, rock material and so that doesn't make a whole lot of sense plus we were having problems with communication so this gave us uh, more evidence that maybe our uh, drive shaft torque sensor is not working and it may be because it was damaged when it was installed there was a problem with uh, installation we cut a wire we had to replace it and fix it so we're, we're looking at that and that's more of that in a second and so um then we we got it so we, we drilled into some uh different layers of rock uh clay stone so this is what uh, what we saw with the with it was we're into some silt here. We have pretty high uh, speed um, and then uh, low injection pressure. Then you get into clay stone. You see injection pressure goes up. You got a little bit of a vibration, higher down pressure, 
little bit higher moving speed. And then we got into a coal layer and we got uh, a little bit of vibration here, a little bit more vibration, no injection pressure uh, or, or hardly any. Lower down pressure, increased moving speed, or decrease, and then it picks up a little bit. And then uh, back into the clay stone, and then you see the down pressure goes back up. Vibrations increase, injection pressure goes up as you'd expect. And then we get into sandstone, and you see the uh, down pressure drops in the sandstone. And it's actually a very poorly lithified sandstone, so it's more like a, a really hard, like a hard uh, or very dense sand. And the vibrations pick up, and the injection pressure goes down. So this proved to us that uh, that the system is, can provide confidence in selection of our layers on our boring log. So we were able to, to use the use this data to come up with a boring log that was uh, not just based on SPT data, but based on continuous uh, measurement wall drilling data. So what's next with uh, with uh, this for all of us? Here's a picture of, of my colleague, Paul Hilchin. He's uh, doing some troubleshooting with the communications of the, um, now the rig is finally back. It's been out for all summer long and now it's back for a little bit. Um, actually, it's back out again, but it was here for last week. So we were able to to get on it and mess, do some, some messing around. And Paul's doing a little bit of, he's doing a, uh, this is the Torque Lake 200 collar. He's doing a torque, he's doing a, uh, he's doing a shut calibration on it there. And so uh, the results of that shunt calibration was the Lord uh, torque link collar outputs a steady signal to the gateway. And, it, and this can be viewed by this laptop. You can see the torque as you adjust. And you can mess with the torque by doing that. What he's doing is a shunt resistance, like a resistor. Or you can manually torque with your hand. And this is a result of him manually torquing with his hand last week. And he was really excited. You know, he's you got basically five to negative five foot pounds. So it's picking up some pretty good, you know, some pretty low uh, Torque, so that was that was good to know that the Torque Lead 200 is transmitting a, a torque. It's picking up a torque and transmitting. The Jean Luc system, we put a battery on it, 1.5 volt battery, and it picked up and said, okay, and it knew exactly what the uh, amperage was, the milliamps was on that battery. Take it off, it picks that up. Then we calibrated it, and we found that the Jean Luc system calibrates very well with the sensor. So we were happy to see that. But the missing link was we didn't have the Lord system was not able to properly send um, a voltage change across. And so we, we uh, which is a big deal, you gotta, <laughs> they're not communicating. So we, we met with Lord uh, in the last week, we've met with the Lord sensing people. And we walked through it with them in, uh, on, on Zoom and we, we, and we had one of those aha moments where we, we figured out a few things with uh, configuration and noise, signal strength, um, sampling. And, and so these things really were really helpful for us. And we were able to uh, now, pick up whatever's coming out of the Lord sensors now on the uh, coming out of the John Lutz um, every time. So we're really excited about getting this thing out there um, again. But what couple of things we want to look at, option number one that we're, we're, we're looking at doing right now is is uh, in, is uh, having this, um, a, or having the, not the API, but the um, companion flange uh, replay or, or fixed. It's, it's damaged. Uh, one of the wires got damaged. We tried to fix it, but we're gonna to have to have it sent it back, have it sent back, and look, have them look at it again. And so this is uh, this is the schematic of the companion flange. And so we're looking at thinking, well, if we, if we can get sensors put back on there, and maybe we can um, reduce, maybe what we can do is uh, is reduce the the outer the, I, the OD a little bit. So we're looking at maybe um, trimming the the OD just a, a hair to to see if we can get a little bit better resolution and and torque um, over here. You can see put a little channel in there and and maybe. Uh, Get a little bit better uh, torque measurements on that. That's uh, one of the things we want to we want to look at doing. Uh, this is going to cost us about seventeen hundred dollars to do. So um, that's uh, something that's been quoted. So um, that's been shipped back to high tech sensors. They're going to be doing that in the next couple of weeks, and we'll have it back and back on the rig. The other thing we're looked at is we're looking at is maybe inline sensors. This is an inline sensor that we got a quote on about thirteen thousand dollars for this inline sensor, but it can be it can be placed in line. And um, this allows it to be uh, powered, you know, powered uh, in, in line and transmit wirelessly, um, and, and actually yeah, yeah, transmit it wirelessly to the John Lute system. And the problem with this is it, it takes about it's about two two and a half inches here. We have to fit it in, in in between the drive shaft and the companion flange. And after measuring it with the uh, measuring that, that distance and talking to CME, it looks like we're not going to have that much 
So we gotta, we gotta continue to look at this option and see if we can find some inline solution. Uh, another thing we can look at is wired system. Going back to what we originally thought about was a wired system that has this, uh, this loop that picks up the data. Um, it seems like we're going backwards because this is, a, this is not quite as, as cool in the, as, as a wireless, but this, this would be a wired system if we, have, if we keep running into problems with the system we have. So that's what we, um, another thing we want to look at is maybe possibly uh, looking at the, the drive shaft again and, and maybe maybe uh, instrumenting the drive shaft or one, one of the drive shafts uh, possibly something we want to look at too. Another thing we want to look at is, uh, is we want to look at maybe instrumenting the, the hull stem augers, either the five foot flightless segment here or the power head down here, putting sensors on there. And then we'll be able to measure torque at the front end to compare it to the back end, uh, similar to what we're doing with the API. And so once we get all this kind of stuff figured out, which is, is going to be in the year 2021, you're coming soon. Um, we're, we're looking forward to getting this out and, and out in the field again and, and doing some uh, hull stem augering and getting some correlations with, uh, with that. And also, you know, looking at sidewall drag and uh, auger weight, like Ben was saying in the Q&A, figuring out how that influences things and looking at um, casing advancer and coring systems and, and how the Maybe may coming up with some kind of correlation like the Summerton or the um, drill index that they that John uh, Dr. Benoit was talking about earlier. Um, we have a big project coming up in eastern Montana uh, soon, and it's going to be about a 19 mile project that's off complete offset alignment through big, huge valleys and dips and, and, and soft, soft silts and loose sands overlying IGM, you know, very soft rock um, to some sandstone that's that's very, very strong sandstone. So we're, we're looking at uh, getting this system back in in the next month and on this on the rig and so we can do uh, that project. And we also want to collaborate with DOTs and, and Federal Highway Administration to, to meet the goals of this initiative and help out with some of the things that uh, Florida DOT and Dr. Benoit and other people are looking at. This index that he's talking about, the SPT, or I'm sorry, the CPT index, similar thing, that's something we would love to be helping with as well as we collect more data. So that's uh, that's where we're going. And if anybody has any questions, this is a good time to ask them. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. Appreciate that presentation. Yeah, we've got quite a few uh, questions in the, the chat for uh, really all of our panelists. Uh, let's see, let's go back to a few earlier ones here. Um, what is the holdback pressure? If anyone wants to jump in there, feel free. It's basically, um, uh, this is Jean Benoit. Basically, the, if you look at a, uh, a cylinder, pressure cylinder, it's just a pressure on the backside of the cylinder. And I think Paul answered that question um, as well, right? Um, and, and it's not something that we, we haven't used it. And he's right in that this is not something that we do in here. Uh, but they do measure hold back pressure uh, in in Europe. Paul, you might want to jump in. Sure, maybe I'll add a little bits to it. Um, also, the Jean Lut system, the one that you see on the screen there, is very common for like larger production rigs, like deep foundation rigs. Right. So they use the same type of system on there. So the hold back pressure is more relevant to the. So, uh, their type of work where they need actually pressure to hold up the tool because it weighs so much and the Kelly bar and other really heavy components of the drill rig are putting all that weight on the bit and also on the working surface of the bit. So there's a need to hold that pressure back so it doesn't bog down the machine and that sort of thing. But that's okay. typically what the holdback is. Yeah. So for, you know, for normal conventional geotechnical work is not it'd be really insignificant pretty much i can also add that they use it to limit the acceleration of the penetration rate uh, through voids or very weak zones for the safety requirements too okay uh is there a published reference for determining overcrowding damage yeah, uh, I think Ben also answered that in the chat box. But yeah, there is a work done by the researchers in Florida, Department of Transportation and University of Florida. Sorry. So um, 
it's Rogers et al. This work has been published in Canadian Geotechnical Journal in 2020. I okay. can also read the title of the paper, which is uh, Measuring Wild Drilling in Florida Limestone for Geotechnical Site Investigation. Okay. Uh, a few questions about um, having this done by somebody other than in-house state DOTs. Uh, how would one deal with a subcontractor rather than state drillers and equipment? And what is the approach to get industry to adopt the sensors onto drill rigs since not all DOTs have these in-house? I've worked mostly with um, drilling contractor. N not a problem at all. You know, they... Uh, they're very willing to to use the system, and uh, we've used we've installed one system. It took a little over half a day, really. Um, so they're they're very willing to to use that, um, and we're going to be installing it on the DOT. But I haven't worked with the DOT yet on on that system. We are, we work with USGS also. We have a, a rig, and we work with them. Yeah, so they're not too many consultants at this time that, that are actually um, monitoring drilling using this um, equipment. Um, that's not to say that it's not available. And um, Jean Lutz actually um, offers the option of renting this equipment. Um, the, one of the um, sticking points is going to be crowd, so, or, or torque, excuse me. So if, if you're wanting to measure torque, which is a, a, a very important um, measurement for the higher end uh, engineering type correlations. Um, so if you're doing an application that would require a, a class one rig, you would need torque. And, um, you know, not, not just, you know, if you were probing for boulders, that's a class three type system, which you wouldn't need torque. Uh, and you, you could you could get uh, Jean Lutz to instrument a, a rig, air rig, uh, easily. But for the torque component, you're going to have to um, uh, buy uh, like uh, what uh, Nick was talking about, a torque link or some rosette um, fabricated a piece of drill string or drill rod uh, in the drill string um, that can measure that and, and be uh, with a, a transmitter for wireless uh, uh, communication to, to the uh, Jean Lut system or whatever system you have. So, that's sort of the complication on the, the, uh, the mechanical rigs that are very common in, in the US, but uh, there's nothing stopping people to, to do this. Uh, so it, it's, um, and actually CME is very interested in, in looking at the possibility of having this available on their drill rigs. Uh, so that's, that's a discussion that um, they're having right now. And um, we, may, we may see something like that in the future where that's available right off the line uh, on a new drill rig. Okay, and that leads us into, the, I think, the final question that we'll have time for today. How often do sensors measuring the drilling parameters need to be calibrated? Can this be done on site uh, by drillers or would a third party need to do the annu presumably annual calibrations? Any thoughts on calibrating from the team? Well, I'll, I'll venture an answer. Um, the approach that we took at uh, Montana DOT was to actually have the parts instrumented and then calibrated. So the calibration part took or occurred by our, one of our vendors. That's not to say that somebody couldn't put strain rosettes on a drive line or drive shaft or something like that, but they would have to know the load that was being applied to the torque or the torque that was being applied to the dry shaft to get an accurate measurement. As far as uh, the rate at which you should calibrate the item, that's uh, that's kind of like CPTs. They're, you know, some people do it once a year, somebody, some people do it once every so many cycles. Uh, that probably is, has uh, yet to be determined. And that'll probably be determined in the standards, whatever the standard looks like in the future for MWD. But uh, it, yeah, it's as soon as you see a, an er erroneous uh, data point or something like that, or when the, you see the instrument starting to drift, that would be a very good reason to get it calibrated. 
Okay, great. All right, well, at this time, I'd like to thank uh, today's presenters. I greatly appreciate uh, Anahita, John, Paul, and Nick, and my colleague Ben uh, joining us this afternoon for our uh, seventh in the webinar series uh, for the A-game presentations.